Svetlana, the Kremlin princess. How did the favorite child of the Red Tsar become the most famous defector of the Cold War? The Empire of the Red Tsar. Joseph Stalin, worshipped by many, feared by even more. Responsible for the death of millions. He is the father of two sons and one daughter, Svetlana. Here, the human face of the bloody dictator is revealed as the proud father of his beloved daughter, Svetlana. In one of her first interviews in the USA, she remembers... The same person who was merciless to his political enemies, he could be at the same time rather kind and tender with his uh, favorite child. Everything was there, <laughs> cruelty was there and and uh, sending fruits <laughs> and uh, writing tender letters to his daughter was also there. Vasily and Svetlana on a journey to the Crimea. As they grow older, they have less and less contact with their father. This is one of the rare public appearances of Stalin's children. Svetlana seems almost uneasy to be paid so much attention. Но Светлана не особенно это использовала, Василий больше использовал. В то же время не боялись, если проявят нескромность какую-то, и это дойдет до отца, то им попадет. Боялись в этом смысле. After two failed marriages that her father did not approve, Svetlana lives with her son Josef and her daughter Yekaterina in an apartment Stalin has arranged. The children hardly know their grandfather. Josef Stalin dies on the 5th of March 1953 from a stroke. Svetlana is the only member of the family to be called to his deathbed. They never spoke to one another again. Although the relationship between them was difficult, Svetlana mourns her father sincerely. She said, I know that I was not always a good daughter, and my father was not always a good father. But my father loved me, and I loved him. And I think that in the death, everything will be erased. Josef Stalin is carried to his grave. In 1953, the world is dominated by the Cold War. But Svetlana dreams of a life on the other side of the Iron Curtain. Not long after Stalin's death, his daughter decides to use her mother's maiden name. From now on, she calls herself Svetlana Aleluyeva. In the late 50s and early 60s, Svetlana leads a reclusive life in Moscow with her children. She secretly writes her memoirs, the Soviet Union has become a prison for Stalin's daughter. During a stay in hospital in 1963, Svetlana meets an Indian man, Brayesh Singh, and falls in love with him. Um Singh kämpft sie wirklich sehr. Es hat sich herumgesprochen, die Svetlana will wieder heiraten. Aber dazu brauchte sie ja die Erlaubnis, einen Ausländer zu heiraten. Brayesh Singh is seriously ill with a lung condition. Svetlana requests an audience with the Russian Premier, Alexei Kosygin. Und da geht sie zum ersten Mal dann wieder zurück in den Kreml zu Kosygin, der in dem Zimmer sitzt, in dem ihr Vater ursprünglich auch regiert hatte. Aber Kosygin macht ihr klar, Einen kranken Inder müsse sie nicht heiraten. Sie soll ja einen gesunden Russen heiraten. The 
permission is not granted. On the 31st of October, 1966, Singh dies in Svetlana's arms. Svetlana wants to take his ashes to India in person. Since 1964, Leonid Brezhnev has been ruling the Soviet Union. By employing her contacts and her cunning, Svetlana persuades Brezhnev. In January 1967, he allows her to make the journey. By now, Svetlana is 40 years old. For the first time, she is allowed to leave the Soviet Union. Stalin's daughter travels to India. Her children, almost grown up by now, remain behind. It is the peak of the Cold War. In 1967, the Americans are fighting in Vietnam to halt the spread of communist regimes. And the Soviet Union is busy rattling sabers. In India, Svetlana blossoms. She would very much like to remain with the Singh family. But the Indian government won't allow this. After almost two months, the KGB tries to force her to return. But Stalin's daughter decides to make her escape. She said she wanted to defect and she was Stalin's daughter, but they weren't sure she really was Stalin's daughter. Well, that's when the State Department decided that they had to have somebody who could authenticate her. And they picked my father. That very same night, Accompanied by a CIA agent, Svetlana is flown out of the country. She is to meet with George Kennan in neutral Switzerland. He was quite impressed. He, first of all, it was definitely Stalin's daughter. That was not even a question. The Soviet leadership is informed in a secret telegram. At this point, Svetlana's children also discover that she has fled. Sie war ja gebucht auf einem bestimmten Flug und der Sohn wollte sie abholen und er fährt dann am Flughafen und durch Radiomeldungen, dass Stalins Tochter nicht zurückkehrt. At the time, Josef is 21 years old and Yekaterina is 17. She will never forgive her mother for abandoning her. Я уже знала, что она хочет, так сказать, покинуть эту страну, по которой она просто ненавидела. И я всем говорила, которые, ах, 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 я говорила, да вы не знаете ее жизнь, что вы, если бы вы хоть чуть-чуть знали, сколько она здесь переживала и сколько, как ей здесь было нелегко вот, нести вот это имя Сталина. The Kremlin sets its propaganda machine in motion. It is claimed that Stalin's daughter went insane and was kidnapped by the CIA. Worse things are planned. One of these possibilities was to kill her. I don't know did they receive the order to kill her because they could not kill her without uh, Brezhnev approval. On the 12th of April, 1967, Svetlana lands in New York. I was there at the airport. My sister Joan and I were up in a, we were up high and looking down and we could see snipers on the roof. We'd never seen snipers on the roof. And, um, you know, there was tremendous excitement when she defected. The woman once known as the little princess of the Kremlin arrives in America from Switzerland. Svetlana, the 42 year old daughter of Soviet dictator Joseph Stalin sought asylum here. Where one can feel Even before her arrival, Svetlana had sold her memoirs for a record sum of $3 million. Has lost its it's the daughter of the Red Tsar has become a propaganda tool for Western capitalism. If you defected, it was clear that you will become manipulated by CIA and it was, became part of the big political game. At first, Svetlana is hidden on a farm belonging to George Kennan. His daughter, Grace, looks after her there. He made me feel like we had Trotsky in there, that, you know, that she could be any time kidnapped or assassinated. The State Department offered her uh, security, and she turned it down. 
she, I remember her telling me about it, and she was twirling around. She, she was very physically exuberant. She was kind of twirling and saying, I'm free, I'm free. And I was thinking, yeah, you're free, and I'm worried. <laughs> because I was worried. Svetlana receives the international press in a luxury New York hotel and talks about her future in the USA. Well, uh, I think that uh, before the marriage, it should be love. So <laughs> if I will love this country and this country will love me, then the marriage will be settled, but I cannot say now. The public is surprised by her good English. The sale of rights to her book makes Svetlana rich. Stalin's daughter is treated as a media star, proclaiming the joys of freedom. I'm dreaming about the time when two countries, two great countries, Russia and the United States, could become really friendly and people could um, have free contacts and travel here and there. Now Svetlana is invited everywhere. One of these invitations takes her to Taliesin. This artist's colony, set in the hilly Wisconsin countryside, reminds her of Georgia, her father's homeland. It is here that she will find new love. Only a few weeks after her arrival, she marries Wesley Peters, the closest assistant of the brilliant architect Frank Lloyd Wright. Svetlana is already 44 years old when their daughter Olga is born. It looks as though her happiness is perfect, but the reporters who come to talk to her only ever want to talk about one thing, Josef Stalin. It's ironic that the granddaughter of Josef Stalin was uh, is born in capitalistic uh, United States. Well, I don't know. First of all, I don't see any irony about uh, myself living in this country, I feel very much at home here. Her happiness with her new husband is once again short-lived. Svetlana feels restricted by the strict regulations in the artist's commune, though this is the framework of Wesley Peter's life. She buys a nearby ranch for her husband's son, but not even this step can rescue her marriage. She almost always made poor decisions. She was just, I mean, lots of people told her not to give her money away, not to invest in, as we were told, it was in the ranch of her husband's son. She always did exactly what she wanted to do. And that was a little bit maybe the, the princess element I'm referring to. Svetlana moves to Princeton. She lived there before this marriage but her dream of teaching literature at the university comes to nothing. She still has money, though. A second book about her first year in the USA is also a financial success. Schließlich lebt Svetlana im Haus allein mit ihrer kleinen Tochter, Olga, das amerikanische Kind, das kein Wort Russisch sprechen sollte. Sie sollte so amerikanisch werden, the apple pie. She hardly ever appears in public these days. She feels as though she's being watched, followed everywhere. She was very much afraid of other people. In fact, she would come to our house, but she would ask us, please, to not have other people. As she turned down parties to the pres president of the United States twice. She thought she was being manipulated by the CIA often. Stalin's daughter finds it impossible to be at peace. Svetlana moves around the world restlessly. Since her escape from the Soviet Union, she has had no contact with her children. I was prepared not to see them for a long time. But I was not prepared to the idea that they will not be permitted even to write to me. Their well-being depends on the fact that they are cut off from me. Homeless and lonely, Svetlana attempts to find a home for herself with her daughter. 
New headlines in 1984. Svetlana returns to Moscow with her American daughter, Olga. Did her son ask her to come back? On the urging of the KGB and the leaders of the country? This is what Svetlana believes later. She soon feels she is being used by the government for Soviet propaganda. But in fact, the Soviet leadership gradually leaves her alone. After only a year, she is permitted to travel back to the West without any difficulty. Feeling restless, always running, she lives in England for some time and then returns to the USA. Svetlana changes homes more than 40 times. Each time, the residences are smaller and there is less money. Martha Schad meets her at the final stage of her life's voyage. Wir haben ausgemacht, an dem und dem Tag komme ich zu ihrem Altersheim und Svetlana stand vor dem Altersheim und hat auf mich gewartet. The home in Wisconsin accepts the needy. Once again, the highs and lows of Svetlana's life are to be depicted. Und das, was sie mir immer wieder gesagt hat, schreiben Sie über mich und nicht über meinen Vater. But how is it possible to write about Svetlana without talking about Stalin? Land of her father. Yeah. All righty. I stop it. I stop it right away. I'm sorry. I don't want to be. Okay, I I stop it. I don't want quotations from. All righty. Russian papers. All righty. Okay. Dann habe ich die Kamera ausgestellt und sie hat sich wieder beruhigt und fing wieder an zu reden. Und mit welchem Wort fing sie an? My father. Svetlana Adelujeva, the princess from the Kremlin, dies in utter poverty in November 2011. She talked about when she was living in the poor houses with other people sharing bathrooms and kitchens. She was happy about that. She said, this was right. I started at the top, I should end at the bottom. That's the great balance. Stalin did love his daughter, Svetlana, but there was no escape for her from the shadow of his life. Xinjiang is a place where the Silk Road, the world's greatest trading route, is being revived in spectacular fashion. <laughs>